Up next, we have Dr. David Rye, a professor of neurology at Emory University. He's board certified in neurology and sleep medicine. He has received many, many awards for research in hypersomnia and restless leg syndrome, including the Hypersomnia Foundation's first impact award. He and the Emory team are making new discoveries into the origins and treatments of hypersomnia that are transforming the way medicine is practiced. We've invited him today to tell us about one of the toughest challenges in hypersomnia research, which is the search for biomarkers. So thank you, and please welcome Dr. David Rye. Good morning. Is this, there we go. Welcome everybody online. I'm gonna put my watch up here. I like to walk around a bit, but I'll try to limit it, make it easier. And I think I'm gonna get rid of my coffee. So many of you who've probably heard me speak before know that I like to present a little bit about history and big picture things, so be ready. Also, put it in the context of today, and what's in the news, so. It's gonna work. Oops, sorry, gotta go back, right, forward. I have conflicts. Uh, the two biggest ones have been removed. Uh, balance Therapeutics, who you, many of you may remember have been at this meeting before when we uh, were doing clinical trials of their drug uh, in ARISE 1 and ARISE 2, which did not pan out. So, um, and Expansion Therapeutics, which was a company working on using flamazenol in uh, myotonic dystrophy, which is not just a muscle disease. So those in terms of royalties and conflicts have been removed and others are listed. So I step back because I've never given a biomarker talk necessarily to such a wide audience. And so it's interesting when you Google it, uh, it's really mostly surrounding the National Cancer Institute and biomarkers for different types of cancer. Uh, and you can see uh, why, the, just not treating cancer, but the biomarkers market $31.8 billion, right? I mean, if we had that kind of uh, investment in sleepiness, uh, just imagine, right? So FDA, uh, characteristics of the body that can be measured. Wikipedia, measurable indicator of a biological state or condition, which could be a normal one or an abnormal one. And so I looked a little further, and this was very interesting. I, could, I don't know, you can maybe see my slides from the back a little better, but the FDA had a biomarker working group uh, with the acronym BEST. And for those of you, I heard a few people mentioning it last night, have seen a YouTube video about why names matter. I can't remember what I did at some meeting way in the past. Uh, YouTube video, but, and I've stressed it before, I'm, I'm gonna stress it again, as apparently the FDA Biomarker Committee also did. Unclear definitions and inconsistent use of key terms can pose a significant obstacle to medical product development. Can't be more clear than that. So is it hypersomnolence, hypersomnia, narcolepsy, Klein Levin, whatever, they're all important. They're all relevant and important to learn from and treat, but using the terms the correct way and understanding those is really important for communication. Uh, and um, in this, uh, they divided up biomarkers into different types, diagnostic biomarker, monitoring, response, predictive, prognostic, safety, um, susceptibility risk, and then a section that, or a subdivision they call reasonably likely surrogate endpoint. Uh, we'll come back to this slide near the end uh, with respect to response. 
So why are biomarkers important or why are we talking about them? I alluded to it already. It, they're key uh, and integral to drug development. So they hasten success rates, allowing us to look at homogeneous groups or more homogeneous groups as we have talked about or spoken about at this conference is hypersomnia is a symptom, uh, not necessarily a singular diagnosis, but still a symptom of many different ones. So having a biomarker is integral to drug development. You can see here, drugs start at phase, well, preclinical data, then phase one is, most, is safety, and then phase two and phase three. Phase three before it goes to approval by the FDA. So from phase one to who finishes is only 7.9% of all drugs. And so you could throw balanced therapeutics drug in there, for example, as one of the 92.1% uh, did that math pretty fast. 92.1% um, that didn't make the, didn't make it through the past the finishing line. So biomarkers are pretty important. And just to bring it home to the audience, there's biomarkers every time you walk into a physician's office, and this is why I get a little perturbed sometimes with IRBs. Um, I mean, we're doing an experiment every time we see a patient and start a blood pressure medicine and then repeat the blood pressure the next visit and write it down in the chart. Well, that's <laughs> collecting data and storing it. Uh, so that line to me is, is fairly thin. But anyways, you see here your analysis, anything from the blood or blood pressure screening or measurement, those are all biomarkers. So back, we're gonna back up again a little bit. I mean, that was pretty straightforward and simple. Well, where do we start? So what's the first domino? This is the first domino, <laughs> a disease. Right? I mean, do we have a set of symptoms or do we have something we can label a disease? Is there a specific sign or a symptom that tells us that idiopathic hypersomnia or certain types of hypersomnia or hypersomnolence are a unique entity? Okay. So this is interesting. I mentioned this guy back when I was doing that name lecture, but it's a little out of place, but just for history's sake. Um, there were many philosophies of medicine in the 18th century. One of the prominent ones was this guy, John Brown, who was Scottish and made a comment that symptoms are the body's mother tongue and signs are but a foreign language. And he would write in Latin and he had it famous text called Elementa Medicinae. Um, I said that pretty, I think, well, probably a reflection of the Latin we used to speak in Jesuit high school. Um, so um, he, he had a theory of medicine, and I think it may be relevant to, to this topic. Diseases are either overstimulation or understimulation. Pretty simple <laughs> concept, but that was referred to as Brownonianism. And they, they sort of certainly had debates about it. But one of the things is he didn't really much care at that point about knowledge of mechanism. If it helped thinking about it that way and treating it that way with respect to a symptom that mattered to their patient, so, so what? That knowledge would eventually derive itself, but the most important thing was treating the patient and, and, and what big picture, how to look at it. And I've shown versions of this slide before. Many people here online have gone with their symptoms to their various physicians in which door you walk in, whether you walk into the psychiatrist's door, the primary care physician's door, the pulmonary sleep specialist, um, you can get all sorts of diagnoses. Um, but again, the symptom is you sleep too much or you're sleepy or you have a problem in vigilance. So one issue is sort of trying to educate people about how to differentiate between all these different labels, right? And 
you know, these, these are not minor issues, right? Because every one of those labels has a, uh, has a silo and um, stakeholders who want to preserve that silo. <laughs> uh, and when, when I'm glad and thrilled to see this organization blossom and bloom because uh, the only way to get into the, between those silos and educate is, is for an organization like this. Uh, to exist and, and, and um, intrude on this. So here's kind of a summary. We can certainly, by symptoms, separate narcolepsy type 1 from idiopathic hypersomnia and certainly some cases of narcolepsy type 2. Um, narcolepsy type 1, excessive daytime sleepiness, imperative, um, usually with some component of dreaming or a dreamlike phenomenon, most people uh, either initially or eventually develop cataplexy. Uh, other examples of REM sleep discontrol are things like sleep paralysis, hallucinations, acting out your dreams. Well, if you look at hypersomnia in most cases of narcolepsy type 2, that, none of those really hold true. I mean, People certainly have excessive daytime sleepiness, but it's not, I would say, as imperative. It seems to me to sort of be a persistent brain fog or grogginess, but not the sort of sleep attack, so to speak, that you have in type 1 narcolepsy. The REM sleep components are sort of variable. Sometimes you see them, sometimes you don't, or hear of them from patients. Um, unfortunately, lots of people go and read about narcolepsy type 1, and I've heard many explanations of people who perceived they had cataplexy, which were not cataplexy, and that's always problematic also when looking at other literature and seeing uh, patients described as type 1 narcolepsy based on someone's opinion that the patient has cataplexy. We rarely see it in clinic once or twice a year, and that's in our clinic. <laughs> So I'm, I, I've made errors in judgment before. Um, I'm not sure there's anyone that can be 100% certain. Cataplexy rare, REM sleep discontrol rare. What, what's more characteristic of idiopathic hypersomnia and narcolepsy type 2? Most people prolonged, not usually restless sleep. They sleep a long period of time. Their awakening from sleep is laborious. Um, the restorative quality of sleep is generally gone. And when they take a nap, it's not a nap, as one of my patients said, uh, or Dr. Trotty's patients once said, it's not a nap, it's a coma. And having a dampened sensorium throughout the day or inability to think or cognitive problems is much more common in my, my 30 years of doing this than it is in type 1 narcolepsy. Uh, I guess the other question we often ask is, do you wake up spontaneously on your own without an alarm clock? And most narcoleptics, type 1, uh, have no problem waking up without an alarm clock. Um, we'll come back to that. So why has it been hard in IH to come up with a biomarker? Well, the consensus definition is changing, or has changed probably should change again. Uh, so in ICSD-2, as many of you know, the International Classifications of Sleep Disorders version 2, there was a short sleep and a long sleep version. And then in ICSD-3, they looked at that paper from um, Isabel Arnolf, who was not in any way supportive of it, and they said, oh, these people don't look any different in terms of their demographics their age, their medicines, ah, let's just put them together. <laughs> I mean, it's not a great, uh, you know, uh, reason for doing it. So the other issue is that we don't have a clinical pathway that's like a big six-lane highway going through Charlotte uh, I-85 and a validated way to measure too much sleep over a long period of time. It's not in our clinical pathways. And Dr. Trotty alluded to this a little bit in her talk, is 
bottom line, the tools we use to diagnose and to measure outcomes were all tailored to type 1 narcolepsy. They were made for that. That's what they were honed to. They were meticulously tailored so they could get patients in the 90s and the turn of the century into their trials and have a homogeneous group of patients. So one thing about the ICSD2 is it tends to be very much with the thought that there was going to be a research implication, not just a clinical diagnostic one. I mean, the multiple sleep latency test was developed as a research tool, <laughs> not a diagnostic tool. I can go to the story of <laughs> Uh, how that came to be, but I won't. All right, and then there's this issue of mimics and comorbidities alluded to in the, uh, the uh, elephant slide and also by Dr. Trotty. Some of those include depression, bipolar disease, chronic fatigue syndrome. We see some comorbidities in postural orthostatic tachycardia, also Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, also attention deficit disorder, always on the list is not sleeping enough. I would say that one of the things we see most often that's a confound is somebody sleeps two days a week, 12 hours, because the other five days a week they sleep four and they think they have hypersomnia because we have to treat those two days, you know, and they don't attach it. And, and I want to say, we're not speaking about those, those folks, right? Then there's hormonal and nutrient deficiencies. Um, I bring it up at these talks often as pre-anemic iron deficiency. We'll get to that in a moment. And neurologic disorders. And as Dr. Trotty also, I mean, it's almost like we came from the same place or something. <laughs> or somebody trained her or she trained me. Um, that, and we did our slides separately, so I can guarantee you this is just how we think, <laughs> um, is that there's considerable overlap, right? Um, monoamines, which most of these psychostimulants work on, increasing their availability in the brain, dopamine, noradrenaline, serotonin, histamine, the same drugs and or ones that do the same kind of ultimate mechanism also have been used to treat depression. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, if you're depressed, you're also not very vigilant, right? You have some cognitive problems because you feel depressed. And, and so this is very complicated, right? So these drugs, you know, many docs, if you go out in the community and you say, they don't do a multiple sleep latency test, and they say, and you ask them why, and they say, well, I'm gonna put them on the same thing anyway. I'm just gonna put them on a, one of these drugs that increase monoamines, and so who cares what the MSLT shows? And to some extent, you know, yeah, I mean, and I can see that. So this is just an example of this two comorbidities, just to make a point or reemphasize it. So um, on, the, on the left is the, from the Dunwoody convenience store, walking distance from my house. And what's the message here if you wanna buy ice? You wanna increase your focus and elevate your mood. Really? Well, it turns out if you're iron deficient, what happens? You get fatigued, you sleep a lot, your mood is poor, and you start chewing on ice, which is referred to as a general phenomenon, pica. Um, and there's actually a really nice book, if anyone wants to read, called Eating Earth by an anthropologist from Columbia, uh, University of Columbia, not Columbia, South America. Um, so iron deficiency we look at often, um, particularly because the women, uh, patient population is primarily young women. Uh, as we saw in Dr. Trotty's talk, 70% is probably right. Uh, and young women of childbearing age, one third, 
have pre-anemic iron deficiency. This is known, not taught in medical schools in the United States, recognized by the World Health Organization, although you know there's other reasons not to pay attention to them at the moment. But um, the person on the right is what happens when you have a really good patient who has obsessive compulsive disorder, who uh, is plotting uh, the rows across that are white and black are 24 hours. And each row is a day. You can see there on the far right, the blue, that's December. Black is sleep. And then January, two months. I he actually brought three years of these in. So I actually have it, whoever has been in my clinic, and I've actually taken them over to show it. I still have it taped to the, to the wall because it's, I, I just say, geez, if I had every patient I had brought data like this, you know, <laughs> we could get someplace. Um, and then January. And then he writes in little numbers, which you can't read on the far uh, right, is how many hours he slept. And black is hours, right? So a lot. Right, so he's got 16 and a half, 16 and a half, 16 and a half, 16, 17, 16, 16, 13, 12, 12. So he's got hypersomnia, right? If we believe him, I have no reason not to, but there's a really odd thing going on, right? <laughs> With the blue arrows. Every night, he, or every day, you know, wherever he happens to be, he's going to sleep at a different time and it's later, consistently later. This is what happens if you get put into Mammoth Cave with no environmental stimulus. This is called a free-running rhythm and just delays, 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 delays. And that's the, the, the you know, so there's multiple things going on here, right? He's got hypersomnia, but he also has bipolar disease. He's got obsessive compulsive disorder and he has a free-running rhythm. And he's not blind. This is what a blind person would look like, too. So you can see that this can get, I use these two examples just to say, you know, <laughs> these are the things, you know, there are certainly zebras, unusual causes of hypersomnia. I know you all were, some of you were just in Rome at the World Sleep Meeting. Unfortunately, my wife and I were unable to attend. But we have been in Rome, and one time I was walking down the street, and my wife and I said, "Still, wait, wait, I got to take a picture of this street name of this sign." And she's like, "Oh, come on, you know, anybody want?" To? I said, "Oh, this will come in useful for a talk sometime." <laughs> and for those in the back who may not be able to see it, it's called Via di Propaganda. Uh, and that by which I'm referring to the multiple sleep latency test. <laughs> um, it is poor specificity, poor sensitivity in diagnosing central disorders of hypersomnolence or hypersomnolence that's present in other disorders. And what those other disorders are, you know, it all depends on who gets tested, right? So it's all about pretest probability. So an example, what do I mean? Good, we're in a good place, time-wise. Um, so years ago, we started just recording everybody who had Parkinson's disease, because they tended to be sleepy and nobody had ever done it. So we were like, hmm, this will be interesting. So we did, I don't know, 30, 40 patients. Well, one third of them had narcolepsy, supposedly by their MSLT. You know, multiple REM sleep onsets, fell asleep in less than eight minutes. Well, you would only know that if you had sent the patient for a test, right? So one of the problems is you don't know what you don't know, right? That famous Don Rumsfeld quote. Um, so that's a big issue. You don't know what the negative data is. We're all focused on a confirmation of something we think we know exists, like narcolepsy type one, narcolepsy type two. And so Dr. Trotty and I and uh, one of our residents published the first paper showing that if you take people with these diagnoses and test them twice, you get a different result half of the time. 
that's not good. If you got a hemoglobin A1C today and it was nine and somebody said you got insulin resistance and type two diabetes and a week later they did it again and it was five and you don't have insulin resistance or type one diabetes, wouldn't that be a little bit life changing? <laughs> I mean, seriously, that's, that's, <laughs> that's the comparison, right? I mean, this is a life changing disorder. And so going back to the comment about using the right words and taking it seriously and measuring things. Right, so what does it mean about the MSLT? That means many people are falsely diagnosed as narcolepsy. And it also means that not diagnosing idiopathic hypersomnia is also happening. And both of these are unacceptably high for a test that you charge $4,000 to do. But there's a whole stakeholder agenda there too. That's the via the propaganda. And then the other problem with this is that between laboratory difference and how you do an MSLT are different. And many people out in the community, even though they get accredited, don't do the test the proper way. And this has to do with staffing and sending people home and staff don't want to come in at 6.30. So I was mentioning some, oh, so narcolepsy. Type one, we now know we have a great biomarker. It's the absence of something, right? We know that if you lose hypocretin deep in the brain, that uh, hypocretin disappears. And so this is a slide from all the people, many who are here and others of spinal fluid samples from y'all. Um, and uh, Hypocretin levels are on the far left, and the different diagnoses are on the bottom. The first one on the left is controls, people with no sleepiness, 18. Pretty much everybody is above 200 picograms per ml. And then there's all of our central disorders of hypersomnolence patients, which is 255. These are not sent to us, these are our patients and our data and yours, I might mention. Uh, and we also found out that for FYI, if you're ever plotting a scatter plot like this using PowerPoint, uh, it goes past, you can't put more than 250 spots on there. So we are actually have 100 more than the 255. So, that's the kind of data you want, big data, right? And the next group is myotonic dystrophy, who can be very sleepy and sleep a lot. That's 13 subjects, they're pretty much normal. And then there's 45 narcolepsy type one patients, and lo and behold, no hypocretin, very low. There's two that are around 100, they're kind of in the, they're affected, clearly have type one narcolepsy, but not real, real low. And then the other ones, you can see the other 43 are clustered at the bottom, close to zero. So you have a diagnosis, type one narcolepsy, unambiguous, right? You have a biological marker. We need something like this, right? And then Klein-Levin syndrome, 10 patients, they're on the far right. Again, pretty much normal. Everybody got this one? So absence of a peptide that's excitatory to all these monoamine systems is a marker, a biomarker, loss of it for type 1 narcolepsy. So as we await development by some pharma for hypocretin agonists, what are we getting? Dr. Trotty went through it very nicely. She cued me up. Didn't know who was gonna go first or second, actually, when I was putting my slides together, but I figured they'd kind of speak to one another a little bit. And so we increase wake in many of these drugs, essentially, and oxibate not being on here, but all the others, by increasing brain norepinephrine, probably dopamine, I put the different drugs in relative position on this Venn diagram uh, in terms of where their actions are. Uh, and 
or thought to be, histamine is wake mix, for example, and serotonin. And so these are what we use, but as I mentioned, also for depression. Now there's a lot of biomarkers under exploration for central disorders of hypersomnolence. Some have been mentioned, I think Dr. Duvalier's will probably speak about some tomorrow. Uh, Self-report measurements uh, are important. They're easy to do, right? We can have people fill out questionnaires as many people have so nicely done when they come to visit us. So there's a hypersomnia index, new, sleep inertia index scale, new, Eve's uh, IH severity scale, and we'll hear about brain imaging today. There's also the whole physiological behavioral, that people sleep longer before you let them nap during the day. What happens? There's people, including ourselves, working with industry on developing way, um, wireless, non-intrusive ways of recording brain waves, EEG, for long periods of time. That would be nice. Um, psychomotor vigilance, Dr. Trotty spoke about a little bit few others. And then there's omics, which we will get to. Proteomics, metabolomics, genomics, and we'll talk about. Now here's just an example of something they showed in Denver years ago. On the far left is total sleep time in minutes of some patients. And then on top of those brown are the different naps. How much sleep did you get during the nap, right? Something not often added to your total sleep when you get tested, right? You're, during the MSLT, you're allowed to sleep for 15 minutes before you're woken up. So theoretically, if they do five and you're very sleepy, that's 75 extra minutes of sleep. Well, add that to what happened the night before, and if we let people sleep 500 minutes, all of a sudden you're 575 and you're past the ICSD, or past the 95% confidence interval for ad lib sleep and controls. Not too hard to institute, right? And so we've done that on and increasingly doing this on people. And you can see there's a group of people here that are even past that, over 700, high 600s, right? So they easily pass the 11 hours of sleep required of ICSD3 for the long sleepers. So just one idea. Now, when it comes to other biomarkers, we can, this is kind of a backward slide, behavioral is on the right. Then there's brain systems, looking at functional MRI, which has been done, and um, diffusion tensor imaging. And then next, you know, PET scans, spec scans, and then genetics. So, um, when we do genetics on the far left, you can do unbiased is preferred, right? You're not making an assumption about what the marker is. And people did this in the 90s and they would expose, you know, flies to something that would damage their DNA and then describe what the fly did or didn't do and call that a phenotype and find out what gene got damaged and contributed to that. And similarly, people did that in mice, still doing it in mice, and um, inbred mouse strains. But, uh, and then try to find a gene. Then the question becomes, is it relevant to humans? So uh, another way is just say, why not do humans? Uh, humans are the best animal model of animal, you know, human disease, right? And, and then there's biased hypothesis testing. I mean, you know there are certain gene changes or certain molecules that in whatever knowledge you have, where it came from, have something to do with sleepiness or sleeping too much. So let's just look at that one gene. So that's biased, right? You have a candidate gene and you say, is it the dopamine system? I'm gonna look at the dopamine receptor. I'm gonna look at the dopamine transporter. I'm gonna look at the hypercretin-2 receptor, so on and so forth. So gene discovery strategies, though, vary by how, how common the disorder is, right? So if we think of, is idiopathic hypersomnia common or uncommon? I mean, if you read what's written, you'd say it's really uncommon, right? But one might contest that if we haven't had great tools to measure it. So you don't really know where you're at on this. So on the... The y-axis is the effect size, and on the x-axis is 
uh, the rarity of, of the marker, right? Rare, very rare, low frequency, and common. So the, for a common, which would be about 5% in the population, the way you go about looking at those is genome-wide significance. So think um, 23andMe. If you're at the other end with a very rare at like one in a thousand, you know, uh, 0.001, which would be a rare event in the, in the genome, then you think of a gene change as very penetrant in the family, autosomal dominant, but it doesn't explain a lot about the population of everybody sitting here. It might explain one family, <laughs> right? Because it's so very rare, but it could still give you insight into potential pathways, right? This is how Alzheimer's disease started. There's, you know, beta amyloid, and that was sort of 20 years ago. So, People have done candidate genes, found some protein products that enhance sleep duration, but they don't extrapolate to the population. You, mutagenesis, same story. There's genome-wide association studies been published, UK Biobank, Charge and Eagle uh, Consortia. But look at these variants. This is but common variants, but if you have one, it only explains that you sleep two to three minutes more <laughs> per copy of the allele. And it doesn't, it's not really heritable because it's so common, right? So 0.01% heritability. So not easy to sort of say that make, makes a big difference to the population. And here's some that are more from genome sequencing or whole exome sequencing from families. So the, the, we published with Emmanuel, I should say, Mignot, on Klein-Levin syndrome. But then uh, Louis Patacek, who's at UCSF, has pretty, been very prolific. I know him uh, a little bit. Um, and the phenotype on the far left is these, they found families where people were only sleeping four to six hours a night. And so they, uh, whole exome sequenced them, and sure enough, they found some point mutations in protein, uh, gene pro genes and their uh, related products like the beta, ad beta 1 adrenergic receptor, or recently the metabolomic glutamate receptor. Glutamate is a precursor for GABA. But you can see these are very rare mutations, 0.00002. So that means what, two in one million people have them? I mean, very rare. So again, are they really extrapolatable to a larger population? Uh, one of my mentors uh, commenting that humans are the best animal model for human disease. And I think there's still a lot of mileage we can make. Uh, with, I grew up doing brain cuttings on Friday with this crazy man, thus the brain. Now, the strategies we heard about to en enhance wakefulness, there's enhancing the monoamine strategies on the left and oxibate, and some people respond to both or take both. And then what we tend to see at Emory a lot are all the other folks that don't respond to them. So <laughs> we, we are, uh, have a, certainly a biased um, view and uh, about, so we don't know uh, how many people don't respond to these traditional things Dr. Trotty spoke about, but we do know, at least in our personal experience, some of it published, is about 30 to 40% of the folks respond to agents that antagonize GABA receptor. So think of that as an anti-Valium medicine. So Valium, too much of it would make you sleepy. Anti-Valium would make that sleepiness go away. So that includes clarithromycin, flamazin, opentolin, tetrazole at all. So years ago, uh, we have identified a small peptide that seems to meet those criteria of being a mini valium and referred to it as uh, others have uh, in the past, endo, endogenous benzodiazepine, so endozepine. This is one of our first patients who uh, you can see on his second test on the bottom, you probably can't from the back, slept for 720 minutes and they still had to wake him up. So he easily makes 11 hours. 
Um, you can also see the first time he was studying, he had three sleep onset REM periods. But on the second time, when they let him sleep 12 hours, there was only one REM onset. So does he have narcolepsy in one study and idiopathic hypersomnia, or does he have both? I right, just go home and think about that, right? I, mean, I, I really, truly don't know. This came up last night, and I said, you know, why can't you have both? I'm like, why not, you know? So this is a frequency histogram. On the left is how many times an event happened, and on the bottom, on the right uh, x-axis, is how many milliseconds. So this is doing the psychomotor vigilance test. You push the button 100 times, and you can see here 17 times he was right around 300 milliseconds. And then the shaded blue, those are all, it took you more than a second to push a button to a light that showed up. <laughs> That's very bad. I mean, sort of a normal is about 300, which is where his mode would be, but not certainly his mean or, and that's 30 minutes after an intravenous slug of flamazenil. Uh, this is kind of what got us really start, you know, going on this. <laughs> and, you know, right, uh, speaks for itself. Recipsaloquitur for all the lawyers in the audience, right? Um, and so other people have been looking for endozepines, and there's sort of an ongoing a search for them, endogenous molecules that the body makes that kind of act like Valium. And, uh, you know, diazepam binding inhibitor is one of them. Again, a group at uh, uh, Huguenard at, uh, again, University of California, San Francisco, keeps coming up in discussion. And this is a diagram I put together for the newest uh, principles and practice of sleep medicine, which is going to be too difficult to explain at this standpoint, or at this point, and too small for the audience in the back. But there are natural analogs, interestingly, of the GABA receptor that antagonize it. And one of which, just FYI, I love historical, is woodworm extract that is in absinthe. And this was published in the Procedures of the National Academy of Sciences that the active ingredient, one of the active ingredients is a GABA receptor antagonist, which would interfere with being sleepy, make you more alert, and probably along with alcohol and the phenol and the anise, make you do and feel strange things, but certainly uh, a hallucinogen. And uh, this book here I've started reading, Absinthe, the Cocaine of the 19th Century by Doris Lanier, right? Many famous artists writers, Edgar Allan Poe, uh, Oscar Wilde, and many French Impressionists. Uh, so we went on the task of, sorry, this is so small. I didn't realize we would be, I'm going to go through this a little quickly. This slide's busy with a lot of information. But we took cerebral spinal fluid, and there's ways to analyze it and do proteomics. And I remember thought Abby on NCIS, right? My magic mass spec machine, I push a button, and 10 minutes later, I drink my, my coffee pow or whatever it was, right? And come back, and it would tell me what was different in this pile of slop from this pile of slop uh, from a crime scene. And so that's what we did. And uh, well, I'll show you some of this data now on large numbers. And we didn't see this, we found something, a small peptide, about 20 amino acids, makes sense from the first paper. And uh, we didn't find it elevated in narcoleptics type ones, we didn't find it in Klein Levin, we didn't find it in myotonic dystrophy. So sort of the opposite of the hypocretins, right? And we said, geez, let's try to measure it in blood. No correlation with spinal fluid. So too bad, we can't do a blood test. And there are some genetic variants in this, which is interesting. It also, and Dr. Jenkins put it on some cells in his assay system, and it does act like Valium. And then we took it more recently and put small amounts in mice in their brains, and they slept more. 
And it has some implica you know, it's a known peptide. Other people have implicated it in modulating interesting things like torpor, hibernation, autonomic nervous system, and metabolism, glucose metabolism. So this is just a little diagram uh, of the process. And you take CSF, bombard it, breaks it into pieces, and then you analyze for these pieces. And so here's the first group. The first group of 69 people, because we didn't have lots of money, but we had some, was controls, 18 on the, on the bottom, on the left. Then we took the original intravenous flamazenil people who we still had spinal fluid left on, which were, and called them responders. And then there were outpatients, many of you who came and had spinal taps who took flamazenil and got better or continued to take it and called them outpatient flamazenil responders. There were 34 of those. And then we took non-responders, six and seven, and then we took, and that was it. That was the 69. And you can see there's people, then we said, well, geez, it's a known peptide. We can measure it different ways. So there was an antibody against it. So we could do like hypocretin real fast, one, you know, two, three day assay. So we could do 46 at a time and did them all. And we did these, and you can see the dots are individual patients. So the, you can see the IV flamazenil responders and the outpatient flamazenil responders. There's some folks up in the 200, 300, 400, 800, 1,000, 1,200, and 1,500 picogram. Whereas all these other ones, the non-responders, the myotonics and narcolepsy type 1, are all below 200 picograms. Now, there are some in the central disorders there who fall below 200, and you say, well, maybe they're normal. Or maybe that's multiple causes of hypersomnia, whatever. So we said, geez, my slides actually didn't get changed, so <laughs> apologize. This is um, the same slide as before, but now what's plotted is not hypocretin deficiency, but in this peptide. And you can see the controls are all below 18, below 200. But now we have the 255, big numbers. And you can see a whole host of patients with idiopathic hypersomnia slash narcolepsy type 2 above the 200 line. A little more interesting now when the number goes to 355 and eight, or 255. And actually even more interesting when it goes to 355. <laughs> Again, thank you for everybody's spinal fluid. This is what you use it for. And you can see here, the controls in red are all in the 50 to 150 range. And look at the distribution of the histogram. You got 150 people over 250, well, actually from 250 to 350 in the patient population. Remember, nobody with type one narcolepsy out of 46 only one was above 200. So this is pretty damn promising, I think. This is, again, hard to explain, but the, there are different variants, genetic variants of this peptide, and each has a different effect on the GABA receptor. The wild type, which is the second panel there, is basically showing you how much GABA does it take to get to 50% activation of the receptor. So you see the wild type peptide in B with GABA is higher, which means it's more enhanced than GABA by itself, which is the first panel A. See, that's below the 50% line. So you're getting more activation with less amount of, the, of this peptide. So that fits. And then there's other versions, C and D, where you either get the same or you get less. And so here is how much the mouse sleeps in the first two hours of the night. Mice sleep when you turn the lights off. They're nocturnal. So they start the first few hours after the lights go off, they sleep a lot. So that's what's plotted here. Baseline, 14 mice, all right, minutes they slept. Uh, they were asleep for about 35 minutes. Then we did artificial spinal fluid. 
uh, again in the same 14 on a different night, and they were about 44 minutes. And then the wild type peptide in green, and these are all female mice, you know why we did all females, given the 70% females, right, with the disorder. And lo and behold, we're up to 75 minutes. And then we took the variant that didn't look any different than nothing, which is like another control, which is purple, and it did nothing. So this is pretty good causative evidence, I think, that something in or near or like this peptide is a culprit in some patients. I am past my time. I want to try to finish quickly. Back to biomarkers. So that's exciting news. I think we have to confirm it, possibly with samples from other people. Share samples. Uh, we probably need to do a few more mice. We need to get a little more specific because it will be a big finding, right? You don't want to put this in some journal that nobody reads, um, which are many. Um, biomarker types. So back to response. And Dr. Trotty brought this up. And I got to tell you, uh, I have moved to this more because diagnosis and treatment is just delayed too much, right? We have a bad test that everybody is wedded to for all sorts of reasons. And then by the time you go back and forth in our medical system and a follow-up and a new visit and another follow-up, I mean, by the time you get a medicine that works can be two years or year and a half. So that's not good, right? If I had sleep apnea, I could go in, get diagnosed, and if it was bad enough, there's some places that I would get treated the night I was there, and I'd walk out with a CPAP machine at 10 o'clock in the morning, and I'd have a diagnosis and a treatment. That's what happens when you have a really good marketing tool. Not the Vatican, but the pulmonary guys, okay? Um, so anyways, to response marker, I've thought about this a lot. I think about these things a lot. So one of the definitions of a biomarker, look at this, a response biomarker, it indicates a biological activity of a medical product or agent, environmental agent, without necessarily drawing a conclusion about how it works. John Brown, 18th century, necessarily linking that activity to an established mechanism. The FDA doesn't care if you know why it worked. We don't know why Oxibate works, but it got approved. So, you know, we're making some progress on defining maybe what a mechanism is, which is pretty exciting, I think. That's like icing on the cake, right? I mean, can we do something quickly, like, why not a response marker? And then I thought, you know, what happened to the days when I was just a little bean sprout resident? And I used to carry around stuff in my neurologist bag. Now you, you would be put in jail for it by, you know, some regulation from some bureaucrat or uh, you know, you didn't write something about taking it out of a lock box or some pharmacist is over your shoulder. But no, I mean, this is serious, right? I mean, we used to walk around and didn't use these things very often. It didn't come up on a consult. But people use apomorphine injections to diagnose Parkinson's disease. They use a Cinemat levodopa challenge to diagnose Parkinson's disease. Up there, it's a two-hour visit. Myasthenia gravis, which is a weakness in the muscles, we used to take an injection sub-Q of mestidon and see if they got stronger at the bedside. At the bedside. Uh, if somebody we thought had non-convulsive seizures and was unresponsive and weren't shaking, we would push lorazepam and watch. <laughs> if uh, we thought somebody in the emergency room, this came in very useful for me a few times, was it had a catatonia or a conversion disorder, that could spend, you could spend a lot of time and a lot of money, but you guess what? You had sodium amytal, 
from Eli Lilly in Barrington, England, Andrew. Spelled with an I, not a Y. <laughs> so yes, I have used sodium amytal in the emergency room back when I was a bean sprout, and all of a sudden patients didn't have catatonia and they didn't have conversion disorder. So why not use flumazenil? Why not just give people flumazenil in the clinic, like we did initially 10 years ago in IV? Now, we're not going to be able to do IV. Oh, my God, you know, having a, a needle. There might be a heroin addict working in my mist or something, right? Um, uh, so just a point, a caveat to, you know, maybe it won't work, is that the, the, the um, expansion therapeutics, who I mentioned earlier, did a study in myotonic dystrophy, not IH, of IV in 12 patients didn't do anything. So that gets us to where we head. What we know, we know more. What you know you don't know, and then what you don't know that you don't know is pretty big. So uh, for those of you who can't see, this is a famous article by Victor McCusick, the father of human genetics at Johns Hopkins and the father of OMIM, who published a paper on lumpers and splitters. The splitter being a Blinken, lumper being some overweight guy, and then a fence straddler. So look, you know, as a field, me, others, have to decide how we're going to define a case. Is it going to be a long sleep? And is it going to be short sleep? Is it all going to be one? These are going to be very, very relevant. They sound maybe too simple, but they're not simple, right? When you have a whole field of people that want to assert medication responses. What's different between people that respond very well to oxabate, very well to modafinil, or very well to flumazenil? Are they the same or different? Now, I assume they're different. And probably a drug response is probably good. So that is where I think in diagnostic markers, I think we need to catalog all the folks who sleep too much and see if there's any overlap hypothyroidism, I can speak personally, I slept more than 10 hours a night until I got treated. And where in the brain does our putative sleep-inducing peptide live? And what factors make more of it or make less of it, right? Does it change by time of day? Are there other endozepines? And here I would mention neurosteroids, right? Sage Biotherapeutics, I think, is going to be getting into uh, this field uh, shortly. They're in the depression field for neurosteroid drugs that uh, one, it's approved to treat the postpartum depression, but neurosteroids on that cartoon I had before do change the GABA receptor. And then there's genetic approaches. Thank you to everybody uh, who's been supportive, not only as patients, but as donors and philanthropists and just being, you know, when we started this so many years ago, it was, it was just three or four of us. <laughs> and to see this here is just incredible. And the team that I've had, um, Dr. Trot in the upper left corner, sleeping on a, a moss uh, blanket in Iceland, and uh, a lot of others, probably not many of you know. And... Uh, at that, I will end. I realize I'm 10 minutes over, but uh... thank you so much, Dr. Dr. Wright. <laughs>